Brainerd Baptist Church, what a beautiful day to be in God's house as we come together in fellowship and love and, and adore and praise and worship our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, as we begin our worship, if we could turn our attention to the platform here, my brother Carl Willis, one of our choir members, very faithful member who's been singing for a while now, is going to lead us in a solo entitled, The Anchor Holds. God proved his love to me. 
Carl, thank you. Well, good morning, church. Uh, we're going to be reading from Psalm 99, verses 1. The Lord reigns, but the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim, but the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. The Lord, the mighty King, loves justice. You have established fairness. You have administered justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his footstool. He is holy. Please stand as we sing corporately. Good morning. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and forever. Amen. Let's sing it together. save sinners of whom I am the worst. sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him 
and receive eternal life. Great Father of glory, you Father of light, thy angels adore thee, all praise and all praise we should render, oh help us to see, tis only the Thank him. He is the most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, and we worship him today. I pray that as we sing this song, this becomes a song as you sing unto the Lord. We surrender our worship. We surrender our glory and honor to him, our adoration. Church, let's make this a personal song as you lift up your voices to the King of Kings. Sing with us. Light of the world, you step out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down Here I am to say
Thank you, church. Please be seated. Thank you.
One thing I love about our church is you didn't just hear a great choir and a great orchestra perform a beautiful piece of music. You heard brothers and sisters in Christ share many who have walked and had to live those words. Do they believe those or do they not believe those? And they've had the Lord lift their head after some tough, tough storms. And that's an invitation for you today. It wasn't just performed for you. It was an invitation for you to believe, for you to trust in that same God who has proven faithful time after time after time. It's an invitation for you not just to hear about the Lord, but to taste and see that he's good. He really is that refuge, and that's why they were singing and testifying to us today. So I'm grateful, so grateful for the worship ministry of Brainerd Baptist Church and just the hours and hours that go into serving us so that our hearts can be lifted, and not just by, again, not just by music, but by the Lord lifting up our hearts to go. It, it really is true. He's faithful. And so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a few things before we, I do want to take a moment to pray. And that is, uh, one thing is, every Sunday we have a lot of guests. And uh, this may be your first time or maybe one of your first times here. And you may need information on next steps. And we'd just love to be able to guide you into how to get deep, more deeply connected. So right after this church service, there are lots of smaller groups. So that's where a church like this, where it may feel like, like I'm in a room with hundreds of people, how would I get to know anybody? Well, there are smaller groups, we call them life groups. And we'd love to point you to some of those so you could find more information in the lobby. You could certainly talk to any one of the pastors. We'd love to make that connection for you and also tell you more about our ministries. You may have kids, you may have uh, other interests that there'd be other places where you'd be able to connect even throughout the week. So we'd love to have that invitation. There's certainly uh, some information you can get once you get on our website, but we'd love to give some personal introductions. So just wanted you to know that. And then also for uh, those that are members, we do have a members meeting tonight uh, I don't anticipate it being a long meeting, but we will welcome some new church family members, and we do have some order, some um, business things to take care of. So just so you know, that is at 5 p.m. tonight. Uh, this morning, we are going to continue our series in Exodus in just a few minutes, but uh, actually, Pastor Kevin is going to be doing that, and I'm grateful for just his love for the Lord and love for the Word and love for Brainerd. And so I'm grateful for him being willing to do that. I also just wanted to take an opportunity to pray particularly for uh, Kevin's wife, for Laura. So she has surgery tomorrow and uh, you've been in our prayers for the last several months. Uh, you'll be in our prayers tomorrow. Um, if you, as the Lord brings Laura and Kevin to mind, if you, um, if you will commit to pray for them even tonight and into tomorrow, would you please just raise your hand? So I want you to see a hand, hands raised, uh, church standing with you deeply committed to what the Lord is doing. We mentioned Laura, but I, I know the Baggots also realize there's so many that are going through so many tough times. And um, we mentioned her, but it's also a, a realization of a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people have, have dealt with some tough illnesses. A lot of our church family have lost family members. And so uh, we need to hear that song that we heard earlier. We need to be reminded of the Lord's faithfulness. So i just uh, love to read some scripture here in 2 Corinthians and then uh, lead us in a time to pray. Pray particularly for the health needs that are uh, very, very present in our congregation, uh, particularly uh, our sister Laura. So scripture says this, we have a treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. And we are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. Therefore, we don't give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Now, for what is seen is temporary, 
but what is unseen is eternal. Can I pray for us? Father, uh, there is something about being at church with your people that helps to stabilize our hearts. And we pray knowing you hear our requests and you've told us to ask and to seek and to knock. So I pray, Lord, as there are those in our congregation that physically a lot is not going well right now, as they feel vulnerabilities because of a body that isn't working or isn't functioning properly, Lord, I pray inside you would sustain, protect my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray for those that are even uh, watching via the live stream because, again, they, they're just not able to make it. And for some, this has been a lot of weeks and it's weary and tiring. I pray that you would uh, demolish all the arguments of the devil, all the insinuations that you're not good and you're not wise, or maybe you're not in control. Lord, destroy the works of the devil that he would have no place in our head and in our hearts, that we would be able to walk by faith that you are good and you're working all things together for good. Father, I pray that you would bring along people beside, beside the baggots and beside so many others that will help carry loads. Lord, I pray that we'd be a community that surrounds, and whether that's through cards and texts or whether that's through casseroles and visits, I pray that the body of Christ would be seen in all of his glory, that you would help us know how to sustain and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ who are physically weak and tired and worn. I thank you for the impulses you put on our hearts to move toward people and not just to let them suffer alone. Lord, I pray that you would work in ways that show just how glorious you are. We know you are the healer. And so I pray that your healing would be on display at Brainerd Baptist Church, that there would be times where we would have no medical explanation, no technology, no medicine, no treatment plan. We would just have to sit back and go, the Lord worked. And that would bring you great, great glory. And then I also pray that you would work through technology and through medicine, and we would be able to see your hand in those things. And all the medical staff that are and the, the medical personnel that are a part of our congregation, that you give them great skill, that there would be uh, doctors and nurses and, and medical teams and physical therapists and occupational therapists and, and counselors and social workers, all those that would go into uh, extending your love through their professions. Lord, I pray that in the midst of doctors, offices, and hospital rooms, you would give peace that's unshakable, that nurses would not be able to understand the calm and the joy that is found, the hope even in suffering, and that you would be seen in those places, whether it's Erlanger or Memorial or uh, rehab facilities. And Father, I pray for those that are also grieving and hurting, that they would do so leaning toward you, not running away from you. And that that would be a testimony at funeral homes and it posts on Facebook and Caring Bridge sites that it would be a testimony that uh, this world is hard, but you are faithful and you're good. And Lord, I pray through all of this, you would give every person here a clear view of eternity. Lord, we long for the day where we have bodies that aren't wrecked by pain and sin we long for a day where we have resurrected bodies that are just glorious. We long for the days where there are new heavens and new earth, no disease, no, no need for crying. But what we long for the most is to see you, Jesus. We long for the day when that is not dimly, but it is actually face to face. And until that day, I pray throughout all the sickness and disease and the illness that you would keep us faithful and keep our eyes fixed on you, that we would look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we thank you that for the joy set before you, you endure the cross and 
You despise the shame. And you are seated at the right hand of the Father. So make intercession for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray that your hand especially would be on Laura tomorrow and all the medical team that surrounds her. That you would bring a great healing through the surgery. And that we would once again have another reason to give you all the glory. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am so thankful this morning. Uh, thankful first that just for our church, a church that is characterized by people that go to the ends of the earth to deliver the word and disciple folks to follow the same Jesus that, that we worship today. Thankful for the way that you guys have loved uh, Laura and our family. You have gone above and beyond, and, and um, it's really um, no way to express that. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be in God's Word today. I think that uh, Curtis probably needed a week off, and I probably needed a week to be really busy, not thinking about what's coming up, and so the Lord and His uh, graciousness allowed us to do that. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 25 today, and um, so the preacher of the day is also the one that was responsible for uh, putting uh, scripture on the slides, and he didn't do that because he was counting on two things, your grace for me today, and also your ability to uh, find it in the Pew Bible or on your phone or however you find it, and so I want you to get to Exodus um, chapter 25. When we think all the way back to the beginning of Exodus, where we've been on this journey, we, we've seen God reveal himself. He has shown us who he is. He has shown us his character. He's not just shown it to his people, but he's shown it to an onlooking world that was there present in the day, and he shows it to us as we read of, of how he revealed himself to his people. From the burning bush, he reveals his name. He says, I am through signs and miracles, even plagues, he revealed the uniqueness of his divinity. He did things that only he could do, that he was the one true God. That's what he revealed to us. By parting the Red Sea, he revealed a redemptive plan for all of his people. By wandering in the wilderness, he revealed that he was able and that he could provide for his plan. And then we saw the law. And in the law, he revealed that he wasn't just a just God, but that he was also a gracious God, a God that wanted to be in relationship with us and gave us guidelines, allowing us to know what we can do to be in relationship with him. As God revealed each of these aspects, one after another, pieces and aspects, parts of his character, as we learned more and more about him, probably the thing that seems to be the motivating source behind each one of those characteristics that we learn about God, the most incredible thing probably is that God desires a relationship with his people. God desires to know you, not just to know you, but to be with you. He desires to be in a relationship with you and with me and with us. And you think about it, in Exodus, going back, God told us his name, he introduced himself. We learned what God uh, can do, we learned about the plan that he's following, we learned about the resources that he had, basically, he told us what he does. He introduced himself, he tells us who we are, he laid out the ground rules for a relationship, and he sealed his commitment to that relationship with a promise. All of these things are things that happen when someone kind of moves forward, they move into a relationship with someone else. In Exodus chapter 24, we see kind of the culmination of this as we see the one true God descend down from heaven to the top of a mountain and, and a representative of God's people, Moses, climbing to the top of that mountain, the representative meeting with his God, the creator with his created, the sovereign with his subject, a moment of divine encounter on top of a mountaintop. The God of the universe creator, sustainer of all things, desires, pursues, and provides for a relationship with you and with me. It's revealed in every aspect of who he is, his motivation, what he does, teaches us that. And so as we think about our uh, passage today, I would like to 
uh, give you a sermon in a sentence. I love to do this because I want you to be able to, if you just get one thing when you walk out, I want you to get this one thing. If you miss it all, get this sentence, right? So if you're taking notes, write this one down. The revelation of God's character draws us into relationship of worship and obedience to Him. The re- revelation of God's character, who He is, what He shows us about uh, Himself, the more that we learn about Him, the more that we're drawn into wanting and desiring a relationship with Him that will lead us to worship and obedience to Him. The more that we learn about Him, the more that we want to be in relationship with with him. Now we need to take just a moment and consider this. There's a way that we can just kind of say, well, God wants to be in relationship with us. But if we really stop and consider, we know ourselves, we know all the things that no one else knows about us. And we know about God. We have learned about him. We've learned that he is just and that he is holy and that he is righteous. The obvious question should be, he wants to be in relationship with me. He really desires the holy, righteous, just God wants wants to be in a relationship with somebody like me. That's maybe one of the most mind-blowing truths in all of Scripture. It's with that truth in mind that we read the first words of Exodus chapter 25. These words we've read throughout the book of Exodus, they have come in different ways where we hear um, different variants, but we've heard them over and over. You've probably read them so many times in your quiet time, reading through all of Scripture, that you just kind of read over them now, and, and you don't think about them very much. But I want you to hear them today, maybe afresh, in a new way. The Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord talked to him. Holy, righteous God speaking to one who was not holy and righteous. You see, God's character is revealed in his choice to speak to us. It was all the way back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, when God first calls out to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses, and a relationship begins. The God of the Bible, we learn that he's not a mute observer, that he's not separated from us just trying to see, kind of sitting back and seeing what happens. No, he has an active participant in the narrative of all of Scripture. He speaks. He spoke creation into existence. He fellowshiped with Adam and Eve, walking with them and talking with them in the garden. The author of Hebrews, in the first two verses of his book, said, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times, in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Today he speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word, a word that was inspired by him, that was breathed out by him so that we might know him so that we might have relationship with him. God speaks from a desire to be known. He speaks desiring a relationship not just with anyone, but with people like us. You think about it, where would we be without God's voice? We would be lost. We would be without hope. We wouldn't know even what to do to try to begin to have a relationship with him. We would be separated from him. But because God speaks, we have hope. We know the good news. We know how, what we do, the steps we take to be in relationship with him. God's character is revealed in his choice to speak to us. So how do we respond when God speaks? Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives us a very clear answer. He says, let anyone who has ears listen. Listen. God speaks. Our role is to listen. When we listen to the God who speaks, we're drawn to worship him. We're drawn to obey him. The Lord spoke to Moses and the Lord speaks to us today. Will we respond by listening? God's character is revealed in his choice to speak to us. His character is also revealed in his desire to dwell with us. We're going to jump verses uh, 2 and 7, come back to them in a minute. But first, I want to look at verse number 8. 
God speaking, and he says, They are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. This is really maybe the heart of our passage today. It may be the heart of all of Exodus, is that God doesn't just want to be in a relationship where he visits occasionally. God wants to be in a relationship where he lives with us, where he dwells with us, a constant, ongoing relationship. I heard a hypothetical question, uh, read it on social media, heard some things about it, and then uh, it showed up in a strange place. I was listening to a sports uh, podcast, and two uh, announcers, two hosts, they predominantly talk about sports, but this kind of uh, uh, cultural question uh, popped into their conversation. What surprised me about it was that two sports hosts were like adamantly arguing both sides of the argument of this hypothetical question. The question was this, how much would it be worth to have dinner with a certain famous entertainer, uh, entrepreneur, celebrity type? And so they were arguing back and forth, and one of them, uh, the question began, well, would you, would you give, would it be worth $100,000 to have dinner with this person, just, 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 just dinner, just to talk? Well, the person says, well, obviously, I, I would give even more than that. Oh, you would give, you'd give $200,000? Yes, $200,000. Half a million dollars? Yeah, yeah. It would be worth a, it would be worth a million dollars to have one dinner with that entrepreneur, celebrity type. They believe this person who I had previously thought was completely sane argued that dinner with this person, what he would gain from a, a meal converse, conversing with this person, what the knowledge and information that would be imparted to him as they sat over a meal would be well worth over a million dollars, a sacrifice that he would gladly make. Most of us laugh at that, don't we? If you're ever in that situation, take the money. But the more that we think about it, it's actually sad. Most of us will never have access to whoever your celebrity uh, guru of choice is. But we do have access to the creator, the sustainer, the omni-everything God of the universe. He stands at the door and knocks. What's more... The sacrifice that has to be given so that we can spend time with him is a sacrifice and a payment that he's already paid for us. He stands and he knocks. He doesn't want to just leave us his card. He doesn't want to give us his cell number. He's not going to make a promise to fit us into his calendar when he can find Sometimes he doesn't even want to pay us a visit. He wants to come and live with us, to dwell with us. That's who he is. That's who he's always been. It's his character. It's his person. In the garden, he dwelled with Adam and Eve. He walked through the garden having conversation and fellowship with them until sin separated the creator from its created. Throughout the Old Testament, God dwelt with his people, first in the tabernacle and then in the temple. But as we'll see, while he dwelt with them, their relationship was still limited by their sin and his righteousness. You see, a price greater than the sacrifice that would happen in the tabernacle and the temple would have to be paid so that they would have complete access with one another, so that they could truly dwell with one another. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh, Word, capital, meaning Jesus, and dwelt with us. He observed, we observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace. A literal translation of that is that the Word became flesh, Jesus became flesh, and He tabernacled with us. God loved us so much that He sent His only Son so that we might know Him, so that He might be able to dwell with us, so that He might tabernacle with us. The sacrifice of Jesus offered a restored relationship, and, and, and though he would return to the Father, he wanted to continue to dwell with us, and so God chose to dwell with us through the Spirit. 
Not to dwell in a place, but to dwell with his people. Looking forward, God's desire to dwell with us is found in a promise that Jesus made as he left. He promised that he had gone to prepare a place for us so that we would dwell with him throughout all eternity. We have a God who desires not just relationship, but a relationship that means that he dwells with us, that we dwell together. God desires to dwell with us. How do we respond to that? Well, the obvious response is that we fling open the doors to our heart and we invite him in. We don't let him knock twice. We accept his grace. We accept, accept his presence. We welcome him into our hearts and into our homes with worship and obedience, preparing a place so that we might dwell together. That's the obvious response. But then we begin to think about that. How could God ever how could he dwell with us? How could he come into the place of my heart? How do I prepare my heart for him? Well, these questions are on our mind when we look back at verses 2 through 7, but these verses also reveal another aspect of who God is, of his character. God's character is revealed in his choice to speak to us, his desire to dwell with us, but also in the provision, his provision, for a place of worship. Look at verses 2 through 7. God speaks to Moses, tell the Israelites to take an offering for me. You're to take an offering from everyone who is willing to give. This is the offering you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple scarlet yarn, fine linen and goat hair, ram skins dyed red, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx, along with other gemstones for mounting on the ephod and the breast, and the breast piece. Now, when we consider who God is talking to when he asks for this offering, it almost seems like a cruel joke, doesn't it? How is he going to get this offering, this fine, exorbitant offering, from a bunch of people who've just been redeemed from slavery, living as nomads, wandering around in the desert. They probably could have come up with the acacia wood, but where would they find gold and silver, bronze, fine yarn, linen, the best oil, spices, incense, onyx, gemstones? First glance, it appears that God's, uh, he's asked the impossible of them. Promising a desire to be in relationship, but then giving a requirement that they would never be able to fulfill. If, if this is what they needed to prepare a place for him, they would never be able to prepare a place for him. But then you remember. You remember that God may have already done something. Back in Exodus chapter 12, you remember that their Passover is happening. The children are about to leave, about to go out, about to be freed from their slavery. And God uh, gave them an order. Exodus 12, 35 through 36, we read, The Israelites acted on Moses' word, a word that came from the Lord. And they asked the Egyptians for what? For silver and gold items, and for clothing. And the Lord gave the people such favor with the Egyptians that they gave them what they requested. In this way, they plundered the Egyptians. You see, those former slaves wandering out in the desert, they had been carrying Egyptian treasure in their pockets and their bags ever since they were freed. The costly offering that was being asked of them was already in their possession. The children of Israel, they were simply being asked to return to the one who return it to the one that had given it to them for safekeeping. God had already provided the offering. He had already provided all that he needed for the sanctuary. You wonder though how attached that they had become to those things in their pockets and in their bags. The gold, the silver, the fine linens. You wonder if they ever thought, this is what I really deserve. God was paying me back for all of those years of slavery. This is just a little bit of what I actually should have gotten back there. You'll note that, notice that the offering, it's not Im imposed upon the people. It was to come from everyone who was willing to give. God wasn't going to take it back from them. 
The question for the offering was this. It wasn't what and where will I come up with these things. The question was, will I be willing to give these things back to the Lord? What do I desire the most? A little bit of Egyptian retribution or the presence of my Redeemer? It was the question that the rich young ruler couldn't answer correctly, wasn't it? It was one that he made him turn and walk back away from God, not being a follower's, follower of his. God provided for the offering that would be needed. The question that the people would answer is if they would give or not. The question wasn't if they had the provisions and what they needed or not, because God provides for his plan. That is who he is. That is his character. So how do we respond? How do we respond to a God who provides? Well, to follow Christ means that the offering that he needs is that we take up a cross, we die to ourselves. The only offering that Christ asks of us to be his follower is everything. And then we remember that everything we have, everything that we are, that also comes from him. We're reminded not of the rich young ruler, but of the parable that Jesus told of the man who went and found a treasure in the field and he went back and he sold all that he owned because once that he had found the treasure, what once was a treasure to him was no longer a treasure because he had found something of greater worth than everything that he had known before. The result of our offering will be him coming to dwell with us. We lay everything aside because we desire that to walk with our Lord. God's character is revealed in his choice to speak with us, his desire to dwell with us, his provision for a place of worship, and his character is lastly revealed in our passage today in his pattern for a place of worship. Look back, verse number 9. You must make it, God said, According to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle as well as the pattern of all of its furnishings. In the verses that follow, Exodus 25, 10, all the way to Exodus 27, 21, what we see is we see the building plans, the instruction manual for what the tabernacle would be, a a place of worship, a place that God would dwell. We see all kinds of uh, minute details. And then in Exodus 35 and, and Exodus 40, we see the completion of the project Everything prepared. It's ready to be occupied. The ribbon is ready to be cut. God is about to be welcomed in. Two very large portions of Scripture filled with lots and lots of details. Rather than read every one of those details about the pattern that the Lord revealed to Moses to build his tabernacle and how it was fulfilled, what I'd like to do today is just to highlight how each of these elements of God's pattern revealed his character to his people. The first element that you find, if you're kind of flipping along with me in the passage, you'll see the first thing that God gives instruction manual for his tabernacle is the ark. The pattern for constructing the tabernacle, it didn't begin with the structure or the foundation. It began with a piece of furniture, a piece of furniture that would be the central piece of furniture, furnishing for everything that would happen in that tabernacle. It had two purposes. The first was to remind the people of all that God had done. And the second person was to symbolize God's presence with his people. This was the place where God's presence would be. Within the ark, within that piece of furniture, would hold the tablets of testimony of God's covenant. It would be a place that would remind the people where, where God had been faithful to them. There would be a covering on top of the ark where, what, that's called the mercy seat. Two angels would symbolically be bowing towards the middle, bowing towards where the place of presence of God would be. It would uh, give an image of of the throne, of where God would sit, of his rule. The ark was so holy that no one could touch it by penalty of death, a sinful hand touching the holy righteous. The holy righteous ark was not permitted. It was here. On the Day of Atonement, that the high priest would come and make an offering, a sacrifice, so that the people might be in right standing with the Lord. He would go as a mediator between them and between God. 
God's character revealed here in his pattern for the tabernacles. It's consistent throughout Scripture. We see him do similar things throughout. God is a God who wants us to remember his faithfulness. In just a moment, when you came in, you got a cup and and a little uh, piece of of cracker, and we're going to remember in a moment how God has been faithful to us. He has a desire for relationship. He would send Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice, who would also become, Jesus, the perfect high priest, and he would live interceding for us on on our behalf to the Father. We're promised that another day is coming as as well, where we will join with those angels, real angels, around God's throne, worshiping, singing, holy, holy, holy. A pattern that we see in the ark at the very first piece of this tabernacle that will play out throughout all of history. God's character revealed in the ark. Working out from the ark, we find the table. The most important aspect of the table wasn't the table, its structure, how it was made. It was that the table held 12 loaves of bread, symbolizing God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel. Bread emphasized God's presence there with his people, that it was constant. It emphasized his desire to be in communion with them, to be in fellowship with his people. It was from that bread that he provided for the priest. The bread points to the bread of life, Jesus, who would eternally satisfy his people. Bread that wouldn't need to be replenished every day. It's a bread that we will symbolically break in just a moment, remembering the the life of Jesus, his body that was broken for us so that we might be in relationship with him. We move on from the table. We move out just a little bit further, and we move to the the holy place outside of the Holy of Holies to the lampstand. Just outside, we find in that we see in that lampstand that it gave light to the service of the priests who were setting the loaves of bread before God. It illuminated the beauty of God's dwelling. It symbolized, again, God's presence with his people, all things that God would use his people to do moving forward. Again, we see characteristics of God repeating itself. Israel would be a light to the nations, pointing the nations to the one true God, God's people, Jesus coming being a light to the world, his followers of Jesus, moving out into the world, telling of the light so that others might know the light in their darkness. As his followers, we are to carry the light to others. The structure moves on from uh, outside of the Holy of Holies, we move to the most holy place, and then we move out further, and we begin to see the structure of the building that is out there, of this tabernacle, not a building. It was a mobile structure composed of a set of uh, rods and curtains making up three places, the most holy place or the holy of holies where the ark was at, the holy place where the lampstand and the table sat, and then an area that was called the courtyard that was at the border, God's dwelling place, the tabernacle. It visualized God's presence among the people. It would always be set up in the middle of camp with the tribes and the tents of his people set set. Also surrounding all around the building. He would demonstrate that his presence within was with them, but those curtains also demonstrated that there was still, because of their sin, separation between them and the holy, righteous God. They couldn't enter freely into his presence. The tabernacle, when you read all of those details, you'll see that there are Easter eggs and allusions going all the way back to Eden to a time when God would dwell with his people and that he would be able to fellowship freely, talking with them, walking with them, what God desired to restore, that same imagery of Eden. That's what we see here in the tabernacle, in its structure, God's desire to fellowship with his people. The need for sacrifice, though, would be the first thing that you or I and the people then would see as we walked into the sacri- as we walked into the tabernacle. First thing, the most notable thing, the thing that everyone would have remembered was the altar of burnt offering. It would have been impossible to miss. It was massive. But from the way it would be impossible to miss, not just because of its size, but because of the way that it engaged every one of the senses, the heat that came off from it, the blood that was spilt all around it, 
the sound, the smell, the death, all consequences of sin and of the constant need for sacrifice and forgiveness. Stepping into the tabernacle, you would enter into the courtyard. You entered into the courtyard from the east side. If you remember, it was also from the east that Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden. Another picture back to God's desire for what he wanted and what had been lost. An idea that they were restoring that fellowship with him. Interesting, though, as you work through all of these things, you see how the structure goes out, his description and instructions build from the center all the way out. All of a sudden, we see something that seems out of order, out of place. The oil for the lampstand comes into the picture. Its inclusion at the end of this pattern, it seems out of place. There are things about the lampstand that that are clear, right? So the oil was to be of finest quality, Pure oil from crushed olives, it was oil that would have caused very little smoke and would have made a beautiful light. It was to be tended both day and night, constantly, never going out, just as as God would be there, signifying His presence. But why would God, why in God's Word would it be mentioned here? Why does He break the pattern that He was? You see, the symbolism of God's character is clear. God never sleeps, always present. He's always available. But it's possible that its placement here may symbolize something else. We remember remember that the tabernacle and God's people are in the middle of a desert. There's no street lights. There's no billboards. There's zero light pollution. Eventually, every night, every one of the lamps that the people had in their tents would go out. They wouldn't waste the oil in their lamps for a nightlight. Commentators will debate how much uh, light would have been visible from the lampstand inside the tabernacle. There are some who say there's no way that the light was visible. But there are others that say in that type of pitch black night, there's no way that the glow of the lampstand, the glow of God's presence in his tabernacle wouldn't have been visible from the camp. If that's true... It would be a reminder of God's presence, of God's protection, and God's provision that would have stretched out beyond the walls of the tabernacle into the tents of every one of those people that that surrounded it. I wonder, I wonder on the nights when sleep escaped someone, anxiety, frustration, stress, I wonder if they didn't look to the tabernacle to see that they weren't alone. I wonder if the glow of that lamp it wasn't a reminder to them that though they felt like no one was there, that God was there with them, reminding them of his desire to dwell with them, his desire to be in relationship with him, that he was always there. You see, even in the minute details of his pattern for the tabernacle, God chose to reveal his character, his desire to be with his people, to be their heavenly father, and for them to be his children. From God's word today, we have seen that God's character, we've seen it revealed in his choice to speak to us, his desire to dwell with us, his provision for a place of worship, his pattern for a place of worship. So I was thinking about how to close uh, this time together. I a song from my Sunday school days kept coming to mind. It's one that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. Um, It's one that I found some extra verses to. The song goes like this, a time when uh, a man found out that God wanted to dwell with him. The song says, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, what? I'm coming to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. Here's the verses that you may not be familiar with. And as Zacchaeus climbed back down, the crowd began to groan. They did not think the Savior should be seen in such a home. 
They did not know the wee little man was soon to be transformed. Till he said, look, Lord, I'll give to the poor and repay all my victims fourfold. For today, I've been reborn. Today, I've been reborn. And when the wealth was freely shared and the scamming was repaid, the Savior boldly told the crowd a miracle occurred that day. The heart of the wee little man had grown four sizes from the call. And he, he who once was short on love was suddenly walking tall. The revelation of God's character. Revelation of his desire for relationship with us. Revelation of his desire to go to Zacchaeus' house. Well, it drew Zacchaeus into a life changing relationship of worship and obedience to him. Today, how will we respond? Respond to the fact that God speaks. Responding to the fact that he wants to dwell with us. Respond to the fact that he provides what we need to be in relationship with him. How will we respond to the plan that he has to be in an ongoing relationship with him? Will we be reborn? The revelation of God's character draws us into a life changing relationship of worship and obedience to him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be in relationship with you. We thank you, Father, for the way that you have demonstrated to us your desire for that. Most of all, Lord, we are thankful today that you sent your son to die on a cross, Lord, trusting that if we put our faith in him, Lord, if we trust in his sacrifice, our sins will be forgiven and we'll be able to walk in your presence freely in relationship with him. Lord, I ask you that today that we would walk out that way. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Today, as you walked in, you should have gotten a... Uh, a little cup with um, some juice and a cracker in it. We remember today the pathway to relationship. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Corinth, he told them how to take the Lord's Supper, reminding them of what he had done. He said, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took the bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you would, please stand and let's uh, sing to him today. to open your hymnal 294 have thine own way 294 
Search me and try me, Master today. Search and try. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. Snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. I clearly am in church with a lot of Baptists who don't need the hymnal, so you know that song. Like, I grew up singing that one pretty regularly. It is a privilege to have you here at Brainerd Baptist. If there's any way we can pray for you, any ways we can pray with you, we'd love to do that. I wanted to leave you with, um, hopefully we'll see many of you tonight at the members meeting, but I wanted to leave you with both a commission and a blessing. So the commission comes in thinking about the Lord's presence with us that Kevin's reminded us. The commission comes in this way, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then the promise comes here, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go with the blessing of the Lord today.